Good morning. Yeah, my views are very different from uh, the previous speaker. I'm not, I'm not exactly gung-ho about the current state of India's economy. I, I'm, in fact, uh, pretty depressed, I must tell you. Uh, but I'm sure I'll get an opportunity to air my views during the panel discussion. I thought this was uh, an opportunity I was being given to talk a little bit about uh, a forthcoming book, which Penguin Random House is publishing. Uh, hopefully in a few months from now. I'm going through the final proofs. It's always the most painful part of it. And um, I, I thought it, it does deal with the economy, it do, does deal with governance. And I, 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 think, I, I think I'll get an opportunity during the panel discussion to give a viewpoint which would be different. Uh, I found uh, what uh, both Bibek and Shubda said, what was significant was what was not said. No mention of employment, no mention of inequality, no mention of demonetization, just three words, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, the book that Penguin Random House would be publishing is called Thin Dividing Line, and the subtitle is India Mauritius and Global Illicit Financial Flows. Well, uh, the thin dividing line is between what accountants and lawyers call good tax planning. Uh, a not so clever way to describe it is tax avoidance. Uh, on the, the, the thin dividing line is the dividing line between what you might describe as tax planning or legal forms of tax avoidance and what are clearly illegal ways of evading taxes, converting your illegal money into legal money, often described as money laundering, and often this is done through a process which is called round tripping. The money moves through many jurisdictions uh, and eventually black becomes white. You don't have to actually go through 50 shades of gray. But uh, what was very, very significant about the Indian economy, and this is a period when you look at the period all the way from the early 90s when India's economy was opened out, until very, very recently, close to half, certainly 40% of all the foreign money that came to India was rooted through this small clutch of islands in the Indian Ocean. And you, always, you always wondered why, you know, okay, here's a small clutch of islands in the Indian Ocean and they are uh, about two-thirds of the population of Mauritius uh, are individuals of Indian origin. There's a close affinity, of course. Mauritius has supported India in every single United Nations forum historically. So yes, there are very, very close cultural ties between India and Mauritius. Mauritius is also very, very strategically located. The people who live there describe themselves as belonging to the easternmost point of Africa or the westernmost point of Asia. So it's up to you to look at it. You know, the glass can be half empty or half full like the Indian economy. Uh, so what happened is, why did all this money sort of go in through these small clutch of islands? Because it offered certain tax benefits. Across the world, there are about 90 such tax, so-called tax havens. Britain has floated the most of them, you know, or, or many of them, uh, or close to 20 of them. But tax havens are not all little, what they call treasure islands located in exotic locations where you can have a good holiday and in the process also do a bit of business. There are tax havens, for instance, in Europe. There are microstates, principal, 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 so, oh, I'm, my tongue is all twisted up, principalities. There you go, thank you, Arun. Uh, uh, these are Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Monaco, San Marino, and there are tax havens within the United States of America. I mean, Delaware is a classic example. There's a big, tall building in, in Delaware where there are hundreds and thousands of companies registered with the lawyers over there. And one of these companies is controlled by the Trump family, and another, fa another one is controlled by the Clinton family. So I mean, there's something common between uh, these two. So these are methods by which you save on taxes, but you also help people convert black money. Now, over the years, the same sets of countries that had encouraged the establishment of tax havens, these are countries uh, who belong to the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, suddenly realized, no, things are not looking good. 
and a new initiative was started called BEPS, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. And the whole idea was to have a set of norms of which, you know, guard or the generally accepted uh, uh, rules for tax evasion was sought to be brought in, and it's gradually happening in, which includes automatic sharing of information and so on and so forth. And one of the few things that I have supported with the Narendra Modi government, and I must confess here, the very few things I've actually been supportive of this particular government, but one of the things I've been supporting of is the beginning of the gradual closure of the Mauritius route. And the use of a certain kind of overseas derivative instrument called P notes, participatory notes, which have been very, very widely misused. And you know, people keep shouting and screaming about you know terror funding. Mr. Modi said that uh, one of the purposes of demonetization was to stop the use of fake currency notes which were funding terror organizations. None of that has happened. Uh, we still don't know how much money has come back to the Reserve Bank of India. They've been counting notes for the last six months. They might continue for the next six months. We'll have to wait and watch. Tedious process, despite all the machines that they've recently ordered, I understand. Be that as it may, uh, what is these P notes were grossly misused. I mean, to simplify it, maybe oversimplify it, uh, A, company A, was controlled by company B. And company B was controlled by company C. But our regulatory authorities, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, the Reserve Bank of India, either didn't have the capability or didn't want to or chose to turn a blind eye to the fact that who controls com company C? D company. You've heard of D company? Of course you have heard of D company. India's most wanted. So it was a route that was, in my opinion, deliberately kept open, and now it's been gradually closed. Like the Mauritius route, like the Singapore route, they have put in place what are called grandfather clauses, so that the transition is somewhat smooth. So that over the, it's this year and the next year, you'll gradually close this route. But you've already, you know, about 50% of all the foreign money that's come to India over the last few decades has come from Mauritius, has been routed via Mauritius and Singapore. You've closed these routes. I mean, Cyprus was the favorite tax haven for all the investments coming into Russia. But there are other routes that have been kept wide open and continue. And if you notice, uh, if you look at the registrations of uh, foreign portfolio investors and foreign institutional investors, many of them are shifting base. Uh, to other jurisdictions, including the Netherlands, because they want to continue this process. Now, unlike many other countries in the world, including the European Union, where action has been sought to be taken against big companies, the biggest companies, including Apple, saying, look, at the end of the day, if you're doing, if you're operating in one national jurisdiction and you're earning your profits from that jurisdiction, you, you should pay your taxes. So, this is part of a bigger philosophy, a bigger ideology, as to whether the kind of development that we've seen, including the emphasis on growth at all costs, ignoring distribution aspects, including inequality. We've actually seen, and more than one economist have seen, within nation states, across nation states, there have been sharp rise in economic inequality. Is this good for the future of this country? Is this good for the future of the nation? I'm clear, no. Is it adding to social tension? Yes, it is. But the Mauritius route also fits in because in a sense, these are, these are routes that were deliberately kept open for those in positions of power and authority to become richer. And particular sections of people including some of our not so esteemed political leaders and of course their benefactors in the corporate sector have benefited. There's no doubt about that. And the fact is that we have in India, despite claims to the contrary, and I'm sure 
Uh, Professor Arun Kumar has much more to say about this than I, and he's a knowledgeable expert on this. One of the important factors responsible for the huge black economy that we have in this country is the way we fund our politicians, our political parties, the way we fund our elections. And despite all these claims that we are moving towards a more transparent system, uh, these electoral bonds, and a whole lot of initiatives that have been announced and touted, the fact is our systems of political funding remain extremely opaque and are in that sense a huge contributor to the kind of black economy and corruption that you see in this country. And the Mauritius route has been a very, very important part of this. So this book, and I'm here to plug this book, and therefore I hope when it's released, hopefully sometime in October, all of you will pick it up. It looks at, it situates the India-Mauritius Double Taxation Avoidance Treaty and the way it's been misused in the wider global context of global illicit financial flows. And it also looks at cases like Vodafone, where eventually the transfer of a single share in Cayman Islands leads to a transfer of substantial assets in India. How these are done, these complexities, how these deals are structured, multi-layered, and, and the complexity is deliberate in order to, at one level, make it that much more difficult to lift the corporate veil, and at the same time, look ahead and, and make our political and econo economic systems more less opaque, more transparent. So uh, this book actually seeks to look at this as a case study of what we should have done long ago, and we've just begun doing. And we still have a long way to complete this process. And I think uh, much has been said about the need to curb the black economy. And I think it's very, very integral to how we look at our country and how we look at it going ahead. I mean, those, uh, that black money, which was supposed to come from Switzerland, will never come. Mr. Modi himself has acknowledged it. It could never have come because it wasn't there. It may have been there at one point of time, but over the years got spent or laundered. And the claims that have been made that once you bring it back, you can give 15 lakh rupees to each poor family are just ways. I mean, we know Amit Shah described it subsequently as a jumla. But I'm here trying to look at however well we improve our administration, however well we try and streamline policies and processes, however well we go ahead and implement the goods and services tax, we'll be able to go that far and no more until and unless we resolve what are basic structural problems that have contributed to a large proportion of India's economy. Professor Arun Kumar has done all the calculations. Remaining black, the opaque system of political funding, all of which, despite the growth, despite the fact that this government has been incredibly lucky because oil prices have been benign for the better part of the last three years, and uh, that, that has a huge bearing on the working of India's economy because we are importing about 80% of our total requirements of crude oil. And uh, crude oil accounts for about a third of our total imports. Uh, despite all the good news, the bad news is jobs are not being created. The chief economic advisor talked about the twin balance sheet problem, the, the huge problem of non-performing assets of the banking system, the stressed assets of the banking system, at least 600,000 crores. Some people would say 700,000 crores. Our problem staring at us in the face, which we haven't been able to tackle. We haven't been able to make a dent on the issue of creating jobs. It's all very fine to say we need to create uh, more jobs, uh, self-employment has to be picked up, but we actually haven't seen job creation over the last three years. And we see continuing rise in inequality, we see no dent made on the black economy, and therefore, I think until and unless we address these issues squarely in the face, we'd be deluding ourselves about our ability 
to hold our heads high in the Committee of Nations. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you.